<clears throat> All righty. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate you taking a few minutes to be with us today. And we're talking about compliance, Steve. With, this is a huge group, too, uh, by the way. We've, we've got well over 200 registered to be on yeah. part of this. And so this is a, a little hot bit topic, of a hot topic. It's been yep. on the tip of everybody's tongue. Probably goes back even before last year's AEP yeah. because in October of last year, CMS kind of fired a warning shot yeah. that said that they were going to be really looking at the TPMOs, the third-party marketing organizations, and we're all lumped into that. So yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. where... Well, we got a special guest today. It's, it's Chalen Jackson from our good buddies at McNerney Management Group. We go back a long, long way with those guys. They've just been, gosh, back in the day, Dan was really, I looked at him as a mentor to me and Jeff, always helpful. I feel like, I feel like we've been helpful too, sending it back their way, huh, Jalen? You guys oh, absolutely. You stolen some stuff from us over the years, no doubt. Yeah. But now they're really good friends and, and, uh, Jalen's the man when it comes to compliance. So you, I, I, I'm going to tell just a quick story. Okay. Then we got to turn it over to him. There was a gentleman by the name of Bruce, his predecessor that I leaned on heavily with. Bruce was one of the two or three people that I could go in the country when you get these complex compliance questions. Where can I go get some? Yeah. You know, you can know so much and then that's it. Well, when Bruce, I found out he was no longer going to be part of SMS's or McNerney Management Group's organization. Yeah. I thought, who, what am I going to get now? But I can tell you right now that they knocked it out of the park with Man. You know, Jalen. I'm we're build, we're building this guy up. It's a long way down, Jalen. We got you up so high I right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I better, better be careful. Yeah, well, that's right. But welcome, man. We're glad you're here with us today. And yeah, and I will introduce him as the compliance officer for McNerney's management group. That's that's quite a that's a lot. How many employees do you guys have over there now, Jalen? Uh, yep. So we've got about 130 employees now um, here in the building and scattered around the country and, uh, you know, directly working with uh, around 10,000 agents of our own now as well. In, in addition to that, Chalen is the president of the Central Missouri chapter of the NAHU, which is a prestigious spot. But in addition to that, he's a member of the NAHU Medicare Advisory Group at a national level. So Chalen gets an opportunity to bend the ear or have the ear of some people that are legislatively talking to some very important people on our behalf on, on many different fronts. And if we get some time, Michaela, I'll let you just expand a little bit on that. And I'm going to sit back. So go right ahead and start off and tell us a little bit about NAHU and what, what they're up to. Spend a couple minutes there and we'll go on. Sure. Would love to. So as uh, as Steve mentioned, I am on the Medicare Advisory Group with NAHU that uh, informs a lot of our policy directives and legislative activity on the Medicare side of our legislative front. Um, so myself and about 20 other individuals meet monthly to kind of go over policy initiatives and regulatory guidance and uh, help form NAHU's kind of official opinion on those and look for opportunities to create connections and, and drive NAHU's over overall mission. And really, uh, they've been a lot at the forefront of kind of pushing back against some of this uh, regulatory guidance, making some adjustments, ideas for ways that can hurt a little less, but still protect consumers. Um, so if you're if you're not currently a NAHU member, highly recommend it. Uh, there's local chapters all across the country where you can get directly involved at a local, state, or national level, depending on your comfort, and uh, lots of great people to meet and things to be done there. Um, anyone has questions, I'm sure we can get those answered. Um, I am going to go right into it, though, because I want to make sure there I'm sure there will be questions as we go along um, go ahead and type those into the chat as you think of them I probably won't address them until the end just so we can keep the flow going but uh, happy to answer as many questions as you all come up with and going right into it I want to start just a little bit by discussing kind of how we got where we are right now today because I think there's a lot of confusion over why all this new regulation is happening, um, what is new and what is just an expansion of regulation that was already on the books. And then we'll start talking about what these new regulations are, how we can comply with them, and then kind of that mid to long term outlook of are things going to get worse before they get better, so on and so forth. Um, and again, keep popping questions in the chat and we will be happy to answer them uh, at the end here. 
but I really want to talk about this road to 2023 because all of these new guidelines functionally take effect on 10-1 as we start marketing 2023 plans. And really it comes from over the past five years, and it may not seem like it on a day-to-day -day basis, but really we've seen kind of an overall decline in Medicare oversight. You know, we had things like the scope of appointment, you know, back in 2018, 19, we got rid of the 48 hour rule with the scope of appointment. There was a lot of, you know, this end of secret shopping by CMS, you know, for any large part, the decline in secret shopping by carriers. Um, you know, we kind of, we hit that corrective action in the, uh, you know, late 2000s, 07, 08, 09, and then we kind of started declining in our regulatory oversight. But unfortunately, there's been a lot of change in the Medicare industry. Costs, of course, are kind of out of control. Anyone who's ever run a drug quote can tell you that. Um, we've seen a lot of scrutiny right now in Congress and in the media of PBMs, of things like upcoding, prior authorizations, denial of care. There's a lot of uh, just things floating around in the industry right now that are causing scrutiny on the Medicare program, especially Medicare Advantage. And uh, we're looking at in 2023, Medicare is anticipated to spend over a trillion dollars on care. That gets to be some pretty big numbers to accommodate. And of course, that's a very attractive number to a lot of bad actors that may be looking to cash in. So as a part of that, um, we've started looking at, okay, we've got this huge growth in Medicare Advantage. A lot of numbers say that sometime next year, we will likely hit the 50% mark where more than half of all Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. And that's a pretty critical threshold. And I think that's another reason that we're seeing a lot of this scrutiny and kind of looking at, do we need to put the brakes to this? Do we need to make some changes? How can we make sure we're providing access to care? and protecting consumers. And let's talk a moment about that access to care because that was a big reason that a lot of this came about. Leading up to 2020, when the pandemic started, we started looking at access to care as a critical function of what we were doing. We kind of dropped some of the regulatory oversight for telehealth. We changed some billing regulations to make it easier for providers to use care in unique ways that we hadn't done before. And a lot of that opened up access to care. It gave people access to providers and care and, and resources that they may not have previously had access to. But again, it's another thing that opened the door to bad actors. You can't hardly go a, a week without reading something in the news about another telehealth company either going out of business or being sued or being investigated. Uh, Department of Justice and Office of Inspector General doing so many investigations in various people that are touching this Medicare business right now. Even Congress has now started to step in. Uh, you know, Senate Finance Committee recently, Sen Senator Wyden uh, sent a letter out to 15 state departments of insurance to investigate Medicare Advantage marketing in their states and complaints related to that. So you're seeing a lot of activity around what's going on. Let's take a really close under the microscope look at the Medicare Advantage program and whether or not it's providing all the benefits that it should be in terms of access to care, access to benefits, and kind of revolutionizing healthcare. Because a big thing, and a lot of folks um, haven't, haven't maybe realized this, but a big part of CMS goal right now is to get all beneficiaries into some kind of value-based care model by 2030. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean Medicare Advantage. It can mean things like accountable care organizations. It can mean uh, more value-based payment incentives rather than traditional fee-for-service. There's a lot of kind of experimentation going on right now with payment models and how we can get more bang for our buck, or more importantly, more health for our buck for our clients. But to talk a little bit about the increase in complaints, we did see between 2020 and 2021 a massive increase. We went from just shy of 16,000 complaints to Medicare to over 40,000 complaints to Medicare. And that was really kind of what kicked all of this off. We had uh, a lot of things going on with at Medicare. So Steve mentioned earlier the 10-8 memo, kind of the infamous memo. A uh, week and a half before we started enrolling people last year, CMS sent out a letter saying, hey, 
we've got some reminders for you as a plan of some things that you're going to have to do. And I think for a lot of folks that flew under the radar since it was directed at plan sponsors. But of course, in January, we saw all of this come down. So early in January, we saw the first sneak peek at what will become the 2023 Medicare Advantage final rule. Um, it included some sweeping regulation changes. Most importantly, this new idea of a TPMO, a third party marketing organization. And I think for a lot of us, it was a little bit of a shock to the system. We were used to following certain amounts of compliance, answering certain questions pretty commonly, but we were also used to not having to follow a lot of rules that say a contracted call center did. And I think a lot of that came from um, this access to care conundrum, because as field agents, a lot of us got access to tools that we weren't used to having. We had access to things like voice signature. We had access to tools that were not normally in our wheelhouse because we needed new ways to do business to make sure the clients were getting the coverage they needed. And a lot of that was fantastic, but again, it unfortunately opened up the door to some bad actors. And I really think that is where some of this guidance came from. Um, for a lot of people, call centers have been recording their calls for a long time, actual contracted call centers. And uh, that's something that has always been in place. If you read through producer handbooks with most of your major carriers, it will talk about telephonic enrollments must be recorded in their entirety. And that wasn't really an issue until we started getting access to some of these new tools, because the way we kind of always got around it, so to speak, was it only counts as a telephonic enrollment if you're an actual contracted call center. Um, you have to be contracted under a telesales addendum or some other, every carrier handles, handles it a little differently, but it was a special contract for call centers, and it only counted as a telesales application if you were in one of those organizations. But the problem that CMS ran into and that generated a lot of these complaints is as agents gained access, field agents gained access to these new technologies, these voice only signature options. Um, you had a lot of unscrupulous individuals and entities that maybe were contracted as a standard field agent, but were selling exclusively over the phone, operating like any other call center, but they were not subject to some of this guidance, recording calls, storage, disclaimers, things like that. So that's where a lot of this new regulation came from, was trying to do some capture of organizations that fell outside of the scope of CMS's jurisdiction, or at least outside of some of the regulatory guardrails that we had in place previously. And what we saw with that is, again, this big new requirement to use a new disclaimer on all sales calls, in, within the first minute in all your marketing materials, which includes print, electronic, radio, TV, et cetera, um, all electronic communications, but luckily not during in-person appointments. That's something I get asked a lot. Um, but we do have this new disclaimer. We do not offer every plan available in your area. Any information we provide is limited to those plans we do offer in your area. Please contact Medicare.gov or 1-800-MEDICARE to get information on all of your options. That's quite the mouthful, and it does take on average 10 to 15 seconds, depending on how practiced you are, to say that. Um, so I highly encourage everyone to get really used to it, really comfortable with it, and figure out how to utilize the other first 50 seconds of that minute to make sure that you're getting this across in a way that's compliant and uh, also making sure folks aren't hanging up on you. I do think it'll be a little bit of a learning curve, but at the end of the day, um, just another thing we're going to have to do, it'll be no different than the scope of appointment in no time. A pretty common question I get is, what if I do offer all plans in my area? And uh, that's a valid question. It's a good question. And technically speaking, there is a carve out. If you do offer all commercially available plans in your market, um, you do not have to use this disclaimer. However, there's always those kind of catches. Um, we do have things like the Elixir and Cigna drug plans that agents are not able to offer. You have United Healthcare's institutional plans that most field agents cannot offer. So even if you feel like you're contracted with every major carrier in your market, generally speaking, there's always something out there that you're not able to offer. It would be exceedingly rare um, for you not to be licensed and contracted in an area where there was not a plan you could not offer. It could be some small provider plan that only sells directly through a provider group, but since they are available on the open market, even if they're not available through agents, it does mean we need to use this new disclaimer. 
and again, keep popping questions in the chat. I will address them uh, at the end best I can. And I want to talk a little bit about this call compliance. And there's some things here that are still unfolding uh, and getting some final guidance from carriers. But at the end of the day, what's listed in the Code of Federal Regulations, 42 CFR 422.2274, if anyone wants to look it up, um, all calls with beneficiaries must be recorded. Um, in terms of how you can do that, if you're already using some kind of voice over IP phone system, an internet phone, such as ring central eight by eight five nine go to connect there's dozens of them out there um, you probably already have call recording capability even if you're not using it um, another thing to do is if you're using a hardline phone system through a local carrier absolutely recommend calling them to see if it is something that is an option to turn on call recording with your current system and then something that we'll have a lot more information on very very soon is medicare center uh, Medicare Center will offer a call recording option that'll be really ideal for some agents, maybe less ideal for others, um, but we just got a ton of great information released on that today, and I know uh, there will be a lot of webinars going forward kind of explaining the ins and outs of how to use this new call recording technology within Medicare Center. But the big thing to remember here is that these calls do need to be stored for 10 years that you need to keep HIPAA compliance in mind when you're doing that. So you either need to be storing that on a local drive, local server, where you completely control the security and there's no third party involved. Or what I really recommend for most agents, unless you already have a server system set up, is to use some kind of cloud storage system. If you have something like uh, Google Drive or Dropbox and using one of their business paid accounts, they often have the ability to sign a business associate agreement that will bring that storage solution into HIPAA compliance and can be a great way to maintain this 10 year record retention requirement. If you do end up using Medicare Center for your call recording, it's going to store those for 10 years as well, and they'll be storing them within that client file as long as you're properly annotating client phone numbers in those profiles. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions on all of this, and uh, again, I'll try to address those as thoroughly as I can towards the end, but I want to go ahead and keep moving on to vendor compliance. And I think for a lot of agents, myself included sometimes, it is so easy to really, really dive in and focus on the call recording and this new disclaimer that are probably the most visibly frustrating parts of this new compliance guidelines um, and really kind of take a back seat with this vendor compliance. Because the big deal is um, any vendors you're using, you really have to make sure that they are also following these TPMO guidelines. This could be lead companies. This could be if you're um, hiring appointment setters, um, you know, anyone who's getting paid for a function that is part of that chain of enrollment from the time of beneficiary it becomes aware of a plan to the time they complete an enrollment application. And I really want to talk for a moment about a TPMO. I know we promised to say, why am I a TPMO as an agent and broker? Why am I considered a third party marketing organization? And uh, I think that's a valid question. I, I don't know that it's 100% the right question, but I think it is a valid one. And uh, again, when we look at this guidance, we're really talking about regulatory capture. We're trying to capture folks that were falling outside some of the regulatory framework, primarily a lot of our lead vendors. We all remember the famous commercials from last AEP that are still going on now um, that caused a lot of complaints and a lot of issues and uh, generated a lot of the complaints that we saw go to, on to CMS and then probably caused this new guidance. Now, that said, um, even if we were not TPMOs, even if as agents and brokers, we were not third-party marketing organizations, by definition, we are FDRs, first tier downstream and related entities. So as FDRs of contracted plans, we would still be subject to any guidance that applies to the plan sponsors. So really this was going to apply to us either way, whether we were classified as a TPMO or not. So I think the, uh, again, it is a valid question. Why are we counted as a TPMO? Um, I don't know if it's the right question to be asking. And I think we can probably um, create a pretty strong argument for down the road how to kind of walk back some of this regulation. 
And again, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of what the future holds, what things uh, we need to be looking at. Um, but before I go into that, back to marketing for a moment, I want to talk a little bit about marketing material submissions. Uh, again, one of those things that's really easy to gloss over, and I've got a couple more points like that that I want to go over before I get into the future. Um, if you are creating any of your own marketing pieces, not using things uh, already pre-approved by a carrier, by your upline, um, please do be sending those into your upline for review and in case of, uh, of necessity, submission to CMS. There are a lot of things that are marketing materials <clears throat> that uh, may technically fall under the guidelines of communications from a CMS standpoint, and they maybe don't need to be submitted for approval. But anything that is classified as marketing does need to be approved by CMS and the carriers before you're able to use it. So please make sure that if you are using any kind of marketing materials, uh, send those in and uh, get those approved or at least looked over to see if they need to be sent in for approval. Definitely something that you don't want to be caught on the wrong side of. And uh, want to, to talk a little bit about why before I get into the future. Um, let's talk through real quick what a complaint looks like, because the biggest question I get right now is how is all this going to be administrated, overseen? What, what's going to be the requirement? Am I going to get audited regularly? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But right now, today, um, everything is largely complaint based. If you receive a complaint to Medicare based on a plan that you sold, CMS, Medicare, sends that to the carrier who that uh, individual is enrolled with, and the carrier is responsible for reaching out to the agent of record or whoever wrote that application and saying, hey, what gives? Uh, they're going to send you a, a list of questions, typically called a request for agent response, and they're going to ask for any number of information. Um, could be send us the call recording, send us the permission to contact, tell your side of the story. Um, that's one way that a lot of this is actually quite a good thing because generally if you're talking about a telesales application or an application over the phone where there is a call recording, um, you're going to be asked about six questions, three of which are going to be provide all the call recordings and the other three are going to be pretty generic questions about do you recall anything outstanding about this situation. Um, if there's not a call recording, if it's an in-person appointment and you ever get an investigation based on one of those, uh, it's about 36 questions that are generally asked trying to build this kind of body of knowledge of how did that appointment progress what was said what was not said so a lot of information to keep track of definitely want to make sure that if you are buying leads at all this aep you must make sure that those leads are being compliantly generated meaning that they're using cms approved marketing pieces or pieces that are not classified as marketing um, one good thing to check for is if that marketing piece has an smid and if the lead vendor you're talking to doesn't know what that is it's a pretty good sign that you should probably be shopping elsewhere um, that's really my biggest recommendation to folks is if you can't see what the ad is and can't verify that it is compliant you can't really be buying those leads because that puts your contracts, your business at risk. But in talking about the future, um, just from a regulatory standpoint, I think compliance is likely to be center stage for the next couple years. Again, we see this massive amount of spending with Medicare increasing year over year. We've seen what uh, a single drug can do to Medicare Part B premiums. We saw this past year with Adjuhelm, the novel Alzheimer's treatment, and uh, what it did to Part B premiums that's now being walked back. Um, I think it's going to be a major, major talking point for the next couple of years. And I really think seeing the 2022 complaints to Medicare CTM total is really going to be a driving factor in does it get worse before it gets better or not. So at the end of the year, probably early first quarter, we'll probably start getting some data on 2022 total complaints to Medicare. And if those went up or down over 2021, that may be one of the biggest things um, that drives whether we loosen the reins on this or whether CMS continues to impose more regulation. And as I mentioned previously, right now, it is largely complaint-based oversight. If there's a complaint, it's investigated. To my knowledge, there is currently no requirement from CMS or plans from the carriers to do spot checking or uh, blanket audits. They are required to do that periodically of their contracted call centers, but of field agents, that is not currently a plan as far as I know. But I think kind of the boogeyman in the corner, the thing that a lot of agents are concerned about is secret shopping and whether that will become a thing again. 
Um, again, CMS hasn't really done much of that in the past few years. Carriers really haven't done much of that in the past few years. But I think one of the big concerns is it's a lot easier to secret shop people now. Um, you know, back in the day, we had to find someone, send them to an area, send them to a seminar or somebody's office. Now you can have a set of folks sitting in a call center somewhere, anywhere in the country, and they can be calling all of these lead companies and seeing who they get to that's actually a licensed agent and then secret shopping them. Um, so again, another reason to be really careful and cautious of what leads you are buying. Um, don't know that that's going to happen down the road. Again, it's probably going to depend a lot on the next couple years of uh, compliance uh, issues and complaints to Medicare. But I really do think that uh, it is a possibility just because it's so much easier now than, uh, than it used to be. That's kind of the end of the, the main chunk of it. Uh, we all know uh, probably that uh, back in August uh, on the 12th, uh, major carriers met with CMS to kind of go over requirements for, um, you know, some kind of this expectations for enforcements and auditing and things like that. And one of the reasons that I suspect this will be a bigger deal than maybe past compliance actions is another part of that 2023 final rule included compliance metrics as a specific reason to non-renew a plan contract. So at this point, there's a direct correlation between compliance issues, violations and complaints and plans getting their plan contracts renewed. So at this point, it's not just about the uh, star ratings or just about contracted agents. It's about the survival of their plans, which for your clients means, um, you know, preventing service area reductions, preventing mapping over to new plans if those contracts do uh, get terminated due to compliance. Lots of things that it could cause. But again, um, really recommend looking into this, reaching out with any more in-depth questions. Um, and of course, I'm sure we've got some questions in the Q&A that uh, I'll be happy to go through now. Um, okay. Russell yeah, has Taylor, a, we've got we've got we've got a couple of uh, reoccurring ones. How about a Zoom meeting? Is that considered an in-person? Yeah, absolutely. That that's what I was reading through right now. Um, I do see that question a couple of times in here. It really depends. So that's one of those uh, to be determined. Um, right now, we've got written guidance from at least one carrier that says as long as you are using the video feature of a Zoom call, that counts as a face to face appointment and does not need to be recorded. However, if we were not on video looking at each other, it would not count as a face to face appointment and would require recording. Um, that's one carrier. And unfortunately, since we don't always know what carrier we're going to end up selling when we start an appointment until we hear that from more carriers, I'm still going to recommend uh, recording your Zoom, Ring Central, whatever meetings with people um, just because we don't have a consensus from the carriers yet. And unfortunately, it's something where we kind of have to, you know, play to the strictest rules, so to speak. Um, I'm seeing another question here. If we are calling strictly to schedule face-to-face -face appointments, do we need to record those and issue the disclaimer? The answer to that is yes. Uh, again, the way the regulation is currently written, you need to record all calls with beneficiaries, which means if they call in to order a new ID card or ask you directions to the grocery store, that needs to be recorded too. Of course, anything that is a sales and marketing activity. Um, but yes, if you're setting appointments, if your staff is setting appointments, if it is a call with a Medicare beneficiary, it needs to be recorded. And I'm seeing how to obtain a BAA from Google or Microsoft. Um, I'll have to get back to you with a link. I know there's some job aids uh, on both of those on how to actually access um, that business associate agreement. I don't have those links handy, unfortunately. But, uh, but if you would like to pop in the chat uh, privately to the New Horizons team, I'm sure we can get that link out to you. Um, or they can perhaps send that in a follow-up email up to you all. And then I see Don's asking, my first call to a client is to review what Medicare is all about, the different options generally without even mentioning insurance companies or plans, original Medicare, how PDP, Part C, HMO, PPO, et cetera. Do I have to record this, record all of this general discussions? Don, as we mentioned before, um, the current regulation states all calls. So all calls with beneficiaries. If you are contracted with a Medicare Advantage or Part D plan, record them. 
you have no idea where that discussion is going to go. And since you are talking to a Medicare beneficiary, record that call. Michael is asking, does the, sorry, Michael had a couple questions there. Uh, does the disclaimer have to be given to a current client? Uh, Michael, on that one, the answer is yes. If you're completing a sales activity, it does need to be um, given to the current client during the first minute of all sales calls, which would be things like appointment setting, collecting drug lists, presenting a plan, anything related to that chain of enrollment. Now, if the client calls in saying, hey, I lost the ID cards for my current plan, that is not a sales call and you do not need that disclaimer. Uh, just a couple of examples. And then there was another question from Michael regarding, do we have to record if a client gives us a call or if I contact a current client? Um, again, and I'll just keep reiterating this, uh, the current guidance does say all calls with beneficiaries. Uh, someone else is asking, if only selling supplements with no Part D, then none of this applies correct, as a new agent may just skip MA Part D, won't have a lot of pushback, won't we have a lot of pushback from prospects? Um, so there's actually some really good research on, on this. I think you're asking, will there be pros, uh, pushback in terms of the new disclaimer or the uh, call recording? Um, by and large, the answer is no. Um, again, call centers have been recording and required to get consent to record those calls for the past five to seven years. Um, and we've all seen how much business they have done year after year after year. So it really is not a major concern from pushback standpoint for the call recording or the disclaimers. Um, there was some recent research uh, that they did in the uh, recent uh, kind of AEP kickoff with integrity from deft research that by and large, consumers don't care. They're used to it. I called a plumber two weeks ago and they record their phone calls now. There, there's really no avoiding it, no major concerns from the vast majority of clients. In terms of does this apply to supplements if you are not contracted? And here's the part I want to clarify. If you're not actually contracted with any MA or Part D plans, then yes, this largely does not apply to you because you're not offering CMS regulated products. If you're only offering supplements, that said, if you're only offering supplements, you're really only appealing to about 23 to 25% of the market, um, depending on where you live. Again, nearly 50% of people already are on Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, the other half of folks are not all on supplements, unfortunately. They're on things like Medicaid, union coverage, federal retiree coverage, veterans benefits. It's an incredibly small chunk, only around 16 million people that currently have a supplement. Um, so I, I really, at, just as a business decision, can't recommend sticking to supplements only. But of course, that is a personal decision. Uh, Tom is asking, when you are notified of a complaint, how long do they typically go back? Uh, great question, Tom or Thomas, whichever you prefer. Typically, it is related to a particular enrollment. So you'll be asked for anything related to that enrollment. Again, they can go back 10 years. It would be rather odd to go back to an enrollment that occurred 10 years ago. It'd be kind of odd for the person to still be on the same plan at that point. But generally, you're going to get a complaint and it's going to have a request related to that particular enrollment. I enrolled Betty Sue in this HMO on you know, October 19th, 2022. And they want everything from the permission to contact how you initially contacted that client through the end of that enrollment decision. Uh, Jim asking, does this include Medicare supplements or just Advantage plans? I'm hoping we kind of covered that in that previous discussion, Jim. Um, again, even if uh, you're talking about a Medicare supplement, if you're contracted for Advantage or Part D, follow the same rules. Uh, I really doubt you're going to avoid drug plans for folks. Um, if you are, uh, if you're contracted to offer those, even if you're selling advantage. Judith rolling through, uh, said Verizon does not have recording capability. Talked with them yesterday. Good to note, Judith. Uh, again, still recommend reaching out to your current carriers. You never know what, uh, what may or may not be available. But yeah, if, if your current carrier is saying that's not a possibility, highly recommend looking into Medicare Center, looking into a voice over IP phone system. Uh, call your current, uh, current marketer with your upline and uh, they should be able to tell you what's going on. I'm sure there will be a bunch of tra uh, trainings coming out soon and a bunch of options being presented as well. Um, 
Abby missed the majority of the meeting. Will this be recorded where I can see it from the beginning? Uh, that That's more on your all's end. Steve, is this going to be available uh, after the fact? Yes. Yes, it will, Jerry. We'll get it out to everybody by tomorrow. Perfect. Yep. Abby, you are not going to miss out on a thing. Julianne asking, do most of my business by referral and potential clients call me on my cell phone? So must all incoming calls on my cell phone be recorded since most calls are not Medicare clients? Uh, no, you do not have to record all calls on your cell phone, but you will have to recall, record all calls with any Medicare beneficiaries. So there's a couple workarounds for that, you know, setting up a Medicare center as kind of an enrollment number, um, getting folks used to calling that number rather than yours, or setting up a voice over IP system. There are some workarounds, but it's probably gonna be some process changes and uh, just getting used to a little bit newer way of doing business rather than using that personal cell phone. Um, going to be a little clunky at first, but we're all kind of in learning phase this AEP and I'm sure we'll get there. Anne is asking if I use Zoom meetings, can I use the first level of paid service or must I upgrade to the business plan to be compliant? Um, I don't personally use Zoom, Ann. I, I use a system called Ring Central. Um, so, so that may be a, a better question for, uh, for uh, your folks in New Horizons here. Not, not my area of expertise with Zoom. Um, if you are using Zoom to record those, I highly recommend downloading those recordings because I believe Zoom, mo most online platforms are only going to store those recordings for, say, 30 to 90 days. You're still going to need to download those and store them for the 10 years. And again, we're still waiting on some guidance there. If all the carriers come out and in writing say Zoom meetings count as face to face, you don't have to record them. I'll be more excited than anybody. Um, but right now I just don't have enough confirmation from enough carriers to be comfortable advising agents that. Uh, Monty's asking, per the recording of calls, what happens when they call us at a different number and how do we handle this? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask for some clarification on that one. If you if you wanna follow up, are you asking if they, uh, if they call you say on your cell phone versus your office or if they call say, from not the number you have set up in their CRM profile or something like that. Um, so maybe clarify that one for me, Monty. And then Sharon is asking, uh, says, was that a carrier meeting and was told if a client requests not to be recorded, we do not have to record it. Is this true? So on, on this, and this is a big point of contention right now, there is one carrier who has stated that if a client does not want to be recorded, you don't have to record it. Um, kind of like the Zoom question, my biggest concern is that that's one carrier that has said that in writing. Um, if there is consensus, we'll be the first to advise you. Um, but the big caveat there is even if this becomes the case, the big caution is you're still going to have to record and document that refusal to be recorded. Um, and there's going to be probably a lot of scrutiny over whether agents are trying to direct that decision um, or coach people to opt out of recording if that becomes a possibility. But again, right now, um, only one carrier has issued clear written guidance allowing for that opt out possibility. Scott is asking, do you have to say the disclaimer on an initial educational call with a lead well, Scott, I'm assuming you probably bought these leads to sell them something. Um, so yes, you do have to use that disclaimer. And Sharon, I think that was just a follow-up to your initial question. We'll move on to Douglas. What is the best call recording system to use? Um, prefer to use my cell phone since I work remote a lot and operate in 30 states. Uh, Doug, you know, it, it could be the Medicare Center is going to be a really good uh, solution for you. There is going to be a mobile app available for that. Um, it, it may take a little getting used to, but it might be one. Again, I, I'd look out for some educational webinars on how that system is going to work and kind of the deep dive on that. Uh, in fact, if everyone logs into Medicare Center tomorrow, you should be able to hop in and start playing around with stuff is what I understand. Um, but I'm not 100% sure on that as well. So keep an eye out for Medicare Center may be the best solution for you. Otherwise, anything that allows you to have a phone app um, on that cell phone and record calls is probably going to be your best bet. 
Emily is asking, does that disclaimer have to be given each time to each client or just on the first call? Um, if it's a sales call, it's going to have to be uh, stated within the first minute of that sales call. Um, you know, you call someone to set an appointment and they ask for a follow-up call or reminder, or you call them to get a drug list or some other sales related activity, you are going to have to do it on each call. Uh, Scott has asked, what if a customer does not want to be recorded? Uh, I think we've kind of already addressed that. There's not uh, enough clear guidance on that to, uh, to really say one way or another what someone should do. One carrier has indicated that you can document that refusal uh, and continue with the conversation. But uh, again, we don't know what carrier we're going to be selling at the beginning of a call generally. So at this time, still recommending recording if at all possible. And that's something I'll, I'll backtrack a moment to that deft research, which if you guys haven't looked at that, really do encourage you to take a look at that. That was a specific thing they asked, asked uh, those beneficiaries that they surveyed, knowing that this rule was coming out. And, and it was something astronomically small, single digits, I think, or close to that, um, that, that said they cared in one lick about being recorded. And there was actually uh, around 20% of people surveyed said they were actually more comfortable working with an agent knowing there was going to be a record of the conversation. Um, Richard asking if an MAPD or PDP beneficiary who is a current client calls me to discuss final expense life insurance. Record. Richard, that's a fantastic question. That is definitely um, the gray area um, is, you know, if you're a multi-line agent offering multiple products, which uh, calls have to be recorded, definitely anything that could lead to a Medicare discussion or a Medicare sale in any form or fashion. I would say if you, uh, if you offer final expense, man, that's a tough one. There's not a ton of clear, clear guidance on that. That's definitely about the grayest area we're getting into right now. I would advise still record it. And again, I, I want to clarify for a lot of folks, most of these recording softwares um, that you're looking at are going to be recording by default. So the default is going to be to record every single call. You know, if you need to call your plumber or call your landlord or call whoever, you can go in and delete those calls later because you don't have to save those for 10 years. But I highly recommend never putting yourself in a position where forgetting to hit the record button can get you in compliance trouble. So most of these solutions that are going to be automatically recording every call uh, are, are going to kind of fix that problem for you. And if later we find out I don't need this type of call, we can always go in through and delete them. Emily asking, is the disclaimer able to be recorded and played before I get on a call with a client or does it have to be actually said by me on each call? Well, that's a fantastic question. My, my big recommendation on this is to look at your call recording software and determine a couple of things. One is that pre-recorded message part of the final recording. Um, and then even then, that's really only going to work on your inbound calls. Someone calls in, they're going to get the message. This call may be recorded for quality and training purposes, something along those lines. And then they may be able to get this disclaimer as well. But again, pull a couple sample calls, make sure that pre-recorded message is a part of that final recording. Um, the bigger problem is a lot of times on those outbound calls, that pre-recorded message is not going to be part of the call. They're just going to pick up and you're going to have to say it anyway. I think it's a lot better habit to get into to just say that on every call. Um, current client calls in, uh, moving on to, to Tammy. Uh, if a current client calls in with a question regarding their current plan or provider information, there is no selling. Does this not need to be recorded? Only calls selling something need to be recorded. Please clarify. Um, so I, again, I'm just going to continue to reiterate the current statute says that all calls with beneficiaries must be recorded. Uh, questions about current plan info, such as provider lookups, things like that, um, would not be sales. So you would not need to use the disclaimer, but under the current guidance, they would need to be recorded. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep, uh, definitely need to, got a question about mobile car recording product they currently use is not the quality it used to be. Can't hardly hear the client words, only that they are speaking. Um, definitely want to probably look at something new. Again, this is a 10-1 implementation date, so we really only have about three and a half weeks to get this uh, sorted out for folks. Definitely recommend taking a look at Medicare Center, seeing if it's going to be a good solution for you. Um, sorry to hear what you've been using does not, uh, does not work for you anymore. 
and uh, I have another one about using Ring Central. Um, do they have a mobile application? Yes, absolutely. I can pick up and transfer any call to my cell phone, no problem. Um, one of the reasons I really enjoy using Ring Central, um, but again, it's going to depend on what particularly works for your office and your agents. Uh, can you get uh, my email for questions that were not addressed in the conference uh, today, highly recommend. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a follow-up email. Send these over to your team at New Horizons. They are fantastic and knowledgeable folks. I was happy to help them out today, but, uh, but they should be able to answer uh, any of your questions, but always around to help if needed. Um, back to Monty, a couple of office numbers I use as well as uh, my cell, a must with multiple agents in the office, going to be a real adjustment. Thanks for the info. I appreciate that, Monty. I think, like I said, it will be a real adjustment, uh, you know, especially this first AEP. A couple years from now, it's going to be no different than a scope of appointment, mildly annoying at best, but we'll be used to it. And uh, thanks for Medicare Center. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a great solution for some agents. Some agents may need to look into something more robust if they do have a lot of agents in-house, uh, but uh, definitely a great solution for certain people. Julianne is asking about texts and emails, considered recordings correct. How do we get started with Medicare Center? Um, to address the texts and emails, yes, those will need to be saved and retained for 10 years as well. Any, any materials pertaining to an enrollment need to be saved and retained for 10 years. That includes lead cards, that includes emails, texts, enrollment applications, scopes of appointments, and now call recordings. So definitely keep hold of anything related to that enrollment for 10 years. Some things like applications are kept on file by the carrier. Some things like scopes we're generally responsible for keeping track of, um, call recordings, things like that. Now our responsibility as well. And how do you get started with Medicare Center? Highly recommend hop over medicarecenter.com, register using your national producer number, and then reach out to your marketer for more directions and training. Uh, Kathleen, just to answer your question, yeah, Medicare Center is uh, available to folks that are contracted with any integrity partners. Um, by all means, reach out to your current marketers for more details or questions um, and to, to that upline so you can uh, get started with Medicare Center. Um, Sharon is saying, due to my hearing, I have had my cell phone as my office cell, uh, office line. Yep, absolutely super common for folks to be using a cell phone. And again, just going to want to look for some kind of recording app, whether that's through Medicare Center or through some other third party, um, to make sure you can still record those phone calls as required. Joe is asking, what about a voicemail? If I'm leaving one or the client needs one, do we need to save the voicemail for 10 years? Um, yes, absolutely recommend that. Um, that would be an electronic communication. Um, so I would recommend saving that for 10 years as well. You're already gonna have that recording, pop it into the client file or into your storage solution of choice to make sure we have that on hand. Sharon is asking, is this a problem if your cell is your business line and the only line changed this years ago because of moving and the county didn't cover a number I had? Um, again, it, it's not going to be a problem. It may be a little clunkier. There may be some a little more of a learning curve, but there's plenty of mobile apps out there that'll help you record things. Again, Medicare Center may be a perfect solution for you. Highly recommend learning more about that. Uh, Monty, do you know if at this time we will be required to take a new phone number for recording or will we be able to use one of our existing phone numbers for recording? I ask because of the existing phone number, marketing materials, dollar spent already on the marketplace. Absolutely. Totally going to depend on your carrier, your provider, and what recording solution you're using. Um, for example, I know like with Ring Central, some folks are able to port their existing number over to that platform with uh, Medicare Center, you are going to get an assigned number through Twilio, uh, but you'll be able to kind of call in and out from that number. Uh, again, look for more training, more information. Um, as long as you're able to record those calls, you don't have to change your phone number. It may just require a different solution for you than for some other folks that are in different situations. So again, I would reach out with questions on your specific scenarios and what good solutions may be. 
Uh, Judith asking, can you please describe Ring Central and how it works with landlines? Uh, Judith, Ring Central is a voice over IP phone system. Um, I know they do offer physical desk phones. They offer that mobile app calling through computer. Recommend you reach out directly to them. I don't work for them and I don't represent them, so I don't want to say anything wrong. Um, but that is, again, what I use in my office and it worked quite well. But reach out directly to Ring Central for more details on costs and applicability. Um, someone's asking, what about a personal internet website? If I have the written disclaimer, then they call me. Do I need to repeat it? Yes. So if it is a sales call, you are going to still have to use that disclaimer. If you're emailing them, you're going to have to use that disclaimer. If you call them back for a sales reason, you'll have to use the disclaimer. But that is a good call out. I really appreciate you mentioning that. Um, I think we did mention the electronic communications, but I also wanted to specify you do need to have that uh, TPMO disclaimer on your website. Uh, the requirement is prominently displayed, which typically refers to a minimum 12 point font um, on any marketing materials. I don't see anything else in the question box right now, but by all means, um, keep throwing those in. Jalen, I think you see exactly, or everybody sees exactly why uh, you're on the short list when we've got uh, compliance questions in general. You're fabulous. Well, I do what I can. I appreciate everyone uh, hopping on today. And, and again, reach out to the team here at New Horizons with any additional questions. I'm sure they can get them answered. Um, but a lot of stuff, a lot to go over. I know drinking from a fire hose right now, like we all are. But, uh, but again, I really think give us a couple years to get the hang of it. Just going to be another annoying thing we have to do. Jalen, thank you very much. Thanks, Jalen. Hey, absolutely. Thank you all.